people use preliminary data in their R01 grant. And that's what I want to talk about today is how to avoid these types of errors when you're writing your R01. So if you're new around here, my name is Sarah Dobson. I'm a research grant consultant and my team and I help early career researchers get funded at NIH. So the, the main error that I want to talk about is how preliminary data is used in your significance section. And if you've been following along with this series, uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend that you watch the other two videos in this series that I've done. But if you've been following along with the series, you'll know sort of the way I think about preliminary data in the significance section, right? So before we get to preliminary data, the, the very first thing we need to do in the significance section is establish the argument for why your research needs to be done in the first place, right? So you're establishing your argument for your sort of overarching hypothesis or your, your main research question, depending on what is most relevant to you in terms of the type of research that you're doing, right? But what you're doing first is really walking reviewers through your thinking around how you arrived at your research question, how you arrived at your central hypothesis. And the, the most sort of solid way to do that is to synthesize what is already in the literature, right? So you want to draw upon what others and even what you've already sort of published on the topic uh, to describe what is already known about this larger scientific problem that you're ultimately trying to solve. But in doing that, you're also identifying the gap in knowledge that that is the subject of this particular grant proposal, right? So you're establishing what is known and unknown about this larger scientific problem. But one of the things that I've seen before a few times is that some PIs put actually quite a lot of preliminary data in that opening section where they're trying to establish the scientific premise of their entire grant, right? Their entire project. But the issue is when you do that, everything feels really shaky, right? Because you don't have enough foundation for what is already known about the problem. It's all very like, well, we know a little bit about this and we know a little bit about that and early evidence is showing this and that, but there's no, there's no real solid ground there to stand on to get to the point to say, well, actually, here's the gap that we're focusing on. It's, it's almost like you're, you're sending people off in a bunch of different directions. Like, is this the gap? Is this the gap? Is this the gap? And so my recommendation there is to ensure that the argument that you're making to establish the overall sort of scientific premise of your project and you know the gap that you're trying to fill the the hypothesis that you have about about this gap that all of that is 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 pretty solid right um that that you've made sure that you have a strong clear, logical argument that is leading to an obvious gap in, in knowledge. And then the way that you fill that gap is by designing these specific aims and executing these specific aims, right? And that's where the preliminary data comes in. So to me, that is just a lot a lot more solid, right? So you've you've talked about what is already known and then this piece, this one piece that is unknown, which is your gap in knowledge, and then the aims that you have developed, that's where you bring in the preliminary data to say, you know, first we're going to look at it this way, then we're going to look at it this way, and then we're going to look at it this other way. And here's the foundation of why we're doing that, right? And that's that's the preliminary data. And so one of the errors that I see there um, first of all, is that you don't actually include that in the significance section, right? I see this all the time. Um, and again, there are conventions depending on the, the field that you're in. But to me, logically, it makes sense that you would draw on the preliminary data to, you know, establish the scientific premise for your aims. You would do that in the significance section. You would sort of 
foreground that for your reviewers so that by the time you get to your approach, they're already on board. They already understand your thinking. And then you can just talk about what you're going to do next, how you're going to go about achieving your aims. You can get into the more sort of technical details of how you're going to do that in your approach. But the, um, the sort of higher level justification to me makes more sense uh, sort of logically to do that in the significance section. And so that's where we would draw in that preliminary data that speaks to sort of establishing the scientific premise of what you're doing, right? Um, and then uh, again, one of the errors that I see in preliminary data and the use or misuse of preliminary data um, is not having sufficient preliminary data to justify your aims in situations where it makes sense, right? Again, it depends on the type of research that you're doing, how much preliminary data you actually need. But as I've said in, in previous uh, videos in this series, the way to think about it is what key evidence do you have to establish your aims? And that key evidence can come from what's already published in the literature and your preliminary data, a combination of both, right? Or either or. And so, I mean, usually it's a combination of both. Um, and so making sure that you have that, and we're really talking about hypothesis-driven projects here, right? So making sure that you have that in a hypothesis-driven project is, is really important to make sure that you have um, sufficient preliminary data to, to justify why, you've, uh, why you're sort of approaching your aim in the way that you are. If you're doing, uh, intervention research, for example, it's going to look a little bit different because you might have, um, you know, a, a pilot study on, on feasibility or acceptability or something, but you wouldn't necessarily, the way that you design your aims is a little bit different. So it doesn't necessarily show up that way. But as long as you have preliminary data and, and sort of key evidence to justify the development of your aims in in either case, right? And again, that you know, some of that might get uh, drawn from uh, what's already in the literature in in subsequent aims in a in an intervention style project, right? Um, as long as you have enough key evidence to justify how you arrived at your at, at your sort of structure for your aim or or how you're going to approach your aim, that is um, that's going to be usually enough to convince your reviewers, right? And of course, I'm talking in really broad terms here. It's hard to get really um, specific without having a specific example. But for um, for the sake of confidentiality, we don't talk about uh, clients' projects unless they give us permission to do that, right? So um, generally speaking, that's, um, that's how to approach it. And that's some of the errors. And then the final error that I want to bring up is in terms of um, use of preliminary data in the approach section, right? And generally speaking, again, we recommend that you include preliminary data in your approach section that speaks specifically to feasibility. So just reminding reviewers that you have done this before, you know what you're doing, you've got it covered, you can um, draw on some of that in the approach section, or if it's relevant to what you've included in your significance section, you can just point them back to that, right? But, um, you know, being careful to not sort of double up or or over explain, I think is is really important. But the bigger error is not including uh, enough information in your approach section around the the feasibility components that that's you know the relevant to your preliminary data right so those are the main errors that I see in in my work around how PIs use preliminary data so think about which ones are most relevant to you and your situation. We have one more video in this series uh, next week, so be sure to check back in for that. If you found this helpful, I strongly encourage you to sign up for our free resource library. In the free resource library, you'll find lots of tools and tutorials to help you write a stronger NIH grant. So see you next time.